Well, I hope you're getting in the mood for Christmas. Yes, well, one of the big things about Christmas that all of us really remember, whether or not we have been brought up knowing about the Christmas story or not, is about, the, the, about giving gifts at Christmas. Isn't that not right? So everybody in every family, the giving of, and receiving of gifts is a big thing, and particularly for children, um, giving, the receiving of gifts is something that they so much look after, isn't it? look forward to. And uh, so I thought it would be good for us to look at particularly um, the three gifts that were brought at, at Christmas time by the wise men. And, uh, and, and so it's important for us to understand that. For God so loved the world that he gave. God is a giver. And he gave his only son. And he gave what was mostly most precious to him. And he gave it for a reason. And, uh, and obviously, uh, the, the, uh, the cinema showing will explain a lot about that, and that would be really quite ex- uh, exciting. Um, but Matthew chapter 2 gives us very much about the story uh, of Jesus and his birth and what it's about. He was born in Bethlehem and uh, under the reign of King Herod. So he was born at that time, at that season, um, but there were some wise men, or magi, um, or sometimes referred to as, as kings, that came seeking to worship the newborn king of the Jews, came to worship Jesus. These were wealthy people. <clears throat> they were people who were well-educated. Uh, uh, all the scholars agree that they were uh, people of great prominence, Uh, of their time, and they traveled a great distance in order to be able to worship the one true king, because they uh, had knew about the prophetic um, utterances that had been mentioned about who who God was going to send as uh, as a newborn king, and so they came, and a really exciting aspect to that. Now, let me ask you a question. How many wise men were there? Now, everybody says three, don't they? But we actually, I wonder why we think there was three. Because there was three gifts. There was gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Yes, so there was three, so we presume three. In fact, tradition has actually named the guys as Melchor, Gasper, and Balthazar. Now, we don't really know, and most Bible scholars think that there was probably more than that. Um, but, so we don't really know. Um, but, you know, if ever you look at a nativity scene and uh, you put the nativity scene out, there is always three wise men, isn't there, uh, to go with uh, the gifts. And, uh, and so it's important that, they, that, that we understand the, the reason for the gifts that they give, that, that it's more than just they came with three gifts that they thought would be okay, um, they thought would be gifts of the time, that they actually brought gifts because they had meaning. They had symbolism uh, behind what they were given. They were precious gifts. They were valuable gifts. They were practical gifts, but they were also spiritual gifts in what, uh, what they were given. And Matthew 2 says this, when they saw the star, the wise men, when they saw the star, they were filled with misery. No, they were filled with joy. And that's what we want to see, isn't it, at Christmas time, joy. They entered the house and saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasure chests and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. When we come to worship, we come with gifts. We should come with, they didn't come empty-handed. They came with gifts. Now, I don't know about you and for you as parents, but when Kath and I had faith in the dean, nobody brought us gold, frankincense, or myrrh, okay? So we're kind of feeling a little bit, you know. um, They brought us nappies. (laughs) They brought us dummies, uh, tissues, whatever. They brought us some kind of very nice practical things. In fact... Our girls were born in Scotland, and, um, and one of the traditions in Scotland, particularly where I can only obviously talk for where we were in Glasgow, 
is when we took, uh, well, say faith, when we took faith out in the pram, wherever you went, anybody that passed would throw coins into the pram. So that it was like a gift for the newborn baby. Now, I want to say to you, I did a lot of walking around with that pram. <laughs> I think it's time to get out with that pram. Keep going, you know. They, they're the generous people, are the Scottish. They were in every aspect. If you went round to somebody's house, um, they always, you know, they might come round to your house, they would always bring something with, us, with them. Um, they just had that nature, um, which was a fantastic, uh, fantastic thing. But um, so if you're going to have a child, <laughs> let me recommend you go to Scotland, at least with your pram and walk around the streets of Glasgow, you will find it very beneficial. But for these wise men, they brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And all the scholars agree that they were very valuable, they were very practical, and they were very spiritual in uh, their meaning and nature. And so gold speaks of the kingship and was symbolizing that, uh, that a, a king had been born. Myrrh talks about him being the suffering servant, the Lamb of God. And frankincense is what I'm going to talk about today. But before I explain, explain its meaning, I want to tell you a little bit about frankincense. Yes, <clears throat> because <clears throat> my essential oil advisors, and I have many, I wish, is like a Swiss, I am told, like a Swiss army knife of... Um, of perfumes, of, of, um, uh, of medical stuff. It's got so many aspects to it. Now, many um, minerals and things have uh, some good things. So, for example, peppermint is great if you've got an upset stomach. Um, for example, or lavender, as you can tell, I use that a lot. It's got anti-aging benefits. <laughs> and then, of course, there is the, you're sleeping in the spare room tonight, oil that your wife wears. <laughs> uh, you, you don't have wives that are okay. But this is some of the things that frankincense has as properties. It possesses antiseptic. It's an astringent. It's a substance that shrinks tissues to reduce bleeding from minor abrasions. It's caminative. It's a drug that relieves flatulence. You might need that one <laughs> over the Christmas period. It's a diuretic. It means it helps the body get rid of extra fluid and salt. It's also used to treat high blood pressure as well as other conditions. It's a digestive, not the kind that you dunk in your tea, okay? But it aids the digestion of your food. It's a sedative. It helps to calm you and helps to promote sleep. It's a uterine. In other words, it has benefits for the womb. It's a vulnerary therapeutic property. It helps heal wounds. It's a, as I said, it's anti-inflammatory. It's an expectorant. As I mentioned, it's an antiseptic. And it's even anxiolytic and has anti-neurotic effects. It has been shown to be effective in the treatment of cancer. It can have positive effects on brain development, and a study that I particularly appreciated revealed that having frankincense for four weeks, yes, um, <clears throat> it facilitates the acquisition and retention of motor memory in older men with moderate mental status. <laughs> so I need some frankincense, guys, okay, <laughs> to help my memory. Um, in other words, it's good with Alzheimer's and those kind of things. So now you know what a pastor does all week. <laughs> he looks for facts like that, okay. Anyway, I hope you're getting the point of this. Frankincense is like the Swiss army knife of, um, of incense, of uh, fragrant uh, aspects to it. It really is important to it. So in other words, it's a must-have Christmas present. Yes. It's very expensive. It's very practical as I've said, in helping in sickness and in healing wounds. But it is also spiritual. The priests burned this, uh, this frankincense as a fragrant offering 
to God, symbolizing prayer as the smoke goes up to heaven, as if the, it's symbolizing the prayers of the people of God going up to, uh, to, to God. And so it symbolized the priestly nature of Jesus as our high priest. You see, a priest represented the people to God, yes? In other words, in, in the Old Testament, when we read about the priests, they had one role but two functions. Their role was to represent the people to God. And the functions that they had, they had a couple of functions. The priests made sacrifices for the sins of the people because, in other words, they would take an innocent animal, they would slaughter the animal and offer it as a sacrifice for the sins of the people, and uh, it would represent the forgiveness of the people's sins. And the second function of the priest was to pray prayers on behalf of the people of God. So that's what the priest's role is. And so when Jesus came and they were giving him frankincense, they were recognizing his priestly role, that he was the high priest that was sent from God to represent the people of God. So ever since Adam and Eve sinned, there's been a need for our sins to be atoned for, for the price to be paid for our sin. You see, sin today isn't a popular concept. In fact, many people kind of try to stay away from the term or stay away from the fact that we have uh, you know, done, they just might think, oh, we've made a mistake and we might have blown it. And Christmas time, we use it as, a, as an excuse for kind of trying to get our kids to be good. The elves are watching and they're going to have a naughty and nice list. And if you don't have enough on the nice list, you'll get some Christmas presents. And so unfortunately, sin is misunderstood in our, um, in our culture so often. But I want to say to you that if you don't understand the holiness of God, we will always take a casual approach to our sin. So it is imperative that we understand the holiness of God in order to understand why he responds the way he does to our sin. The simple reason is God is holy. Holiness means he is set apart he is transcendently separate from all of creation. He is higher. He is above. He is beyond us. Uh, he's, he lives, uh, is, uh, the scripture says, in light, inaccessible. And so he is perfect. He is flawless. He is pure in his very essence. You see, holiness isn't just one of his attributes. Holiness pervades every attribute of God. So in other words, he is, his, his power is holy. His justice is holy. His, his mercy is holy. His, you know, every aspect of God um, is, is holy with, uh, you know, in, in every way. So he's holy. He's perfect. Um, but we've got to understand that we're not. We're not holy. We're not perfect. We have sinned. We have, as the Bible says, we've all fallen short of God's standard. The standard that God's, God set for us, we have all missed the mark. We have all failed. We've all gone places and done things we shouldn't have done. We've said things we shouldn't have said. Uh, we've, uh, you know, in, in God's scheme of things, our sin has separated us from God. And that sin separates us in our relationship with him because it destroys us. It starts to take away from us um, that, that innocence and that relationship with God because God cannot stand sin. He can't be a part of it. And so our sin hurts God. Our sin is what God hates. He hates sin. So the lies, the deception, the greed, when we gossip or we're judgmental, when we have a bad temper, or when we lust, we are separating ourselves from God because God is holy and we are not. And so there is a gulf that separates us unless, of course, we have someone or we have some way of paying the price for our sin. You see, God couldn't forgive sin 
in a way that itself would be sin, but he had to appease his righteousness. God is a God that is holy, so he has to act holy in every way, and so the price had to be paid. And in the Old Testament, the priests are a picture of what, what, what is to come. They were trying to show us as symbolizing the sacrifices that they did. So they would make sacrifices on a daily basis, but once a year, the high priest would go into the temple and would go into what's called the Holy of Holies. And there, uh, there they would spread uh, the blood uh, of a goat on the mercy seat. And so there had to be um, a sacrifice for sins that were, would be done. And so at the same time as this sacrifice, the high priest would burn frankincense uh, so that the smoke would rise to heaven uh, as the prayers of the people asking God for forgiveness of sins. Now, I don't know about you, but thinking through that imagery of sprinkling blood on the mercy seat, of sacrificing an animal, cutting its throat, the blood going into a bowl, you know, all those kind of things of an innocent things, um, it's a little bit gory, isn't it? And for us, it doesn't always, it seems weird. It doesn't seem to make sense. But what they would do, the high priest, is that they would, they would place their hands on the goat and symbolically would say that this goat was now going to receive all the sins of the people of God. And that what they did is they killed it and then they would, um, often with you, they would have a goat that they would free. So they would kill one and they would set one free. Now the, free that was, the, the goat that was set free, so there's that symbolism of being of paying the price with your life, but there's also that, that aspect of the goat uh, uh, being set free. And, uh, and of course, eventually it would die in the wilderness. It was like cast out of the community so that the sin was gone from the community of God. So I don't know if you've ever heard the term scapegoat. The term scapegoat comes from this. This is the, the, the imagery. This is the occasion when it happened when they would have a goat and uh, the, the priest would lay his hands on it and set it off. In other words, it was the, 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 the goat that was uh, symbolizing taking the sins of the, the people. Yes? So the sacrifice satisfies God's justice, but at the same time, it extends the mercy of God. So once his, his justice has been satisfied, then he can be merciful with us. And so we need to understand that God is a God both of justice and a God of mercy. But he can't be merciful until his justice has been done. And so that was the old covenant. Now, <clears throat> under the old covenant, it was temporary. So the priests had to continually keep giving, keep making sacrifices. They keep having to do it every uh, you know, every year the high priest would have to go into the Holy of Holies, go through the same ritual. So it was kind of over and over done. But we're now not in the old covenant, we're now in a new covenant. And the new covenant is not only new, it is a better covenant. It is a permanent covenant, and it's a covenant because Jesus shed his blood as the Lamb of God in order that, that he would take the sins of the whole world so that it doesn't have to be repeated. Yes? And so as a sinless person, he died. Hebrews 10 says this, For God's will was for us to be made holy. And as we know, we're not holy in ourselves, but that's what God desires of us. That's his purpose. That's his plan for us. He wants to make us holy. By the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ, once for all time. Under the old covenant, the priest stands and ministers before the altar day after day, offering the same sacrifices again and again, which can never take away sins. But our high priest offered himself to God as a single sacrifice for sins, good for all time, good for all eternity. Jesus, as our high priest, paid for our sins so that we could receive the mercy of God. Yes? Now, <clears throat> a way of maybe 
trying to explain this is how God sees sin is, <clears throat> um, I thought about putting under some of your chairs like a stink bomb. Now, you might be glad to know I only thought about it, <laughs> okay? But can you imagine that if there was a stink bomb going off in this room, what would we do? We probably wouldn't stay sitting where we are, would we? We would be off for some fresh air. And if you've, ever, if you've never been around where there's a stink bomb, um, just let me know and I'll <laughs> get one for you just for your uh, pleasure. Um, but they are, they're, they're, I want to say to you, it's like, for example, if you're, and I hope you're not this morning, but maybe if you sit next to somebody or you stand next to someone who's got B.O., and they've, they've not washed for a long while, their clothes are smelling, it's disgusting, and you kind of, it, it feels repulsive, doesn't it? It kind of can take your breath away, you feel like you're going to choke, you kind of, you've got to, you know, and, uh, and so as a result of that, it separates you, doesn't it? You want to be away. That's how God sees our sin. It's repulsive to him. It stinks. Our sin stinks to him. Our, our sin is, it, it has a, a, a repulsive smell to it so that God can't stand our sin. Yes? However, when Jesus died and paid for the, paid for the price for us, he offers us to be able to have a cleanness, to be made new, to be made clean, to be washed as it were, in the, in the blood of Jesus, and to have new clothes. That's what the New Testament talks about. So in other words, going from the smelly and then putting on the robe of Christ. I just need a guinea pig, don't I? Eh? Um, no volunteers. Anyway, um, but you can, ima- you can imagine, can't you? Put, I'll show it that way, and then you don't think I'm a superhero. Um, but can you imagine putting this robe on? This is physical robe, but if you were to take off somebody's smelly clothes and put on a nice clean thing, it would, be, it would make a big difference, wouldn't it? And so it is with Jesus. Jesus clothes us with righteousness. So in other words, what happens is, is where God sees our sin, when we come to Christ and we give our life to Jesus, when we accept what he's done on the cross and we say, thank you, Jesus, what happens is, is we get a new robe. We get a clean robe. And what happens is God then looks at us and no longer sees the filthy clothes, no longer sees the dirty clothes, no longer sees the stench of our sin, but he sees the righteousness of Christ. He sees very differently. So it's Christ that has made as our high priest, has given us a way so that we can, to God, be pure. Yes? So when God looks at us, he no longer sees fault, he sees flawlessness. Because he sees us through his son Jesus. So when you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you're putting on a new cloak. You're putting on a cloak of righteousness, uh, 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 like a frankincense cloak is being put on so that you're able to be different and to have a very different fragrance about you. Amen? And so it's important to us because he is a high priest who understands us. He's a high priest who is able to, to, to know what we're going through. He went through everything that you and I have been through the trials that you've been through, the tribulations that you've been through, the temptations that you've faced. Jesus has faced them all. He understands what it's like to really, to to suffer. What it is to be in the circumstances that you and I uh, find ourselves in. And sometimes we can be in really desperate situations. In other words, our Savior, our High Priest, doesn't just feel sorry for us, but he actually sympathizes with us because he understands he's been there, he's hurt physically, he's hurt emotionally, he's hurt in relationships, he's hurt in so many ways, and so he understands us. Hebrews 4 says this, So then, since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, 
Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all of the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. In other words, Jesus understands what you and I are going through right at this moment in time. He understands the things that you're thinking about, the pressures of life, the stress of life, the worries of life. He understands all of those things that you're going through. So, for example, if you're feeling stress, he understood in the Garden of Gethsemane when he said his soul was overwhelmed in agony to the point of death. He was conceived out of wedlock to a teenage mum. You can imagine the gossip in the local village of how that would be portrayed to him. He lived in poverty. He was criticised. He was ridiculed. He was bullied. He was tempted over and over again by the devil, attacking him at his most vulnerable time when he was hungry and he was thirsty. He had a close friend die, and he grieved the loss with family members. He was accused of things that he didn't do. His friends betrayed him. And worst of all, when on the cross, he felt abandoned and deserted by God. He knows our infirmities. He understands our difficulties, our trials, our tribulations, our troubles, uh, the, the temptations we face, whatever it is that you're facing this morning, he understands. Is a high priest who understands and he has made provision for you and me so that we don't have to worry and to suffer on it. So whatever you feel, he's felt. Whatever it is that you've hurt with, he's hurt. He is our high priest. And so God, in his divine providence, sent wise men with gifts to prophetically speak about the kind of child Jesus would be. That he would be not just the king with the gold, but he would be our high priest, making atonement for our sins. Hebrews 4 says this, So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God, There we will receive his mercy and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. We can come boldly to the throne of our God. Yes, we don't have to cower. We can approach, uh, uh, you know, relationally. We can approach him with freedom. Uh, We can approach him with joy, with confidence, Um, you know, We don't have to approach him in a formal way. Uh, We can just approach him like a father. We can approach him like a brother. We can approach him in relationship. And I think this is so important, isn't it? Now, my kids, to stay with the goat theme, my kids, (laughs) um, when when they were children, they had no problem coming to me and to say how they were feeling, the, the issues that were going on in their, their life, or ask me for something, particularly if it was ice cream. Do uh, you, you know what I'm trying to say? There was a freedom. And when we're in relationship with God, when we know that he loves us, when we know that our sin is covered, we know that we are no longer repulsive to God, because of Jesus, we can come freely. And we can come and know his love. We can know his power. We can know his healing. We can know uh, his, uh, his compassion. We can know... It's comfort uh, to us as we do that. So let's come boldly to receive his mercy. And I believe this morning, that's what we need to do. Yes, Um, we need to come boldly. And uh, just as the worship team come up, I'd like to uh, like us to just to spend a few moments thinking about that and just praying. I want each of us to come to God right now. It might be the busyness of the week, whatever takes over, and it's so easily just the pressures of the week and all sorts of things. Let's just spend some moments now. Let's bow our heads and spend some time before God. And just saying, God, I want to come to you because you are my high priest. You are the one who I can come to who understands me. For us to 
understand the holiness of God. We need to appreciate and fully understand what our sin is to God and how that makes God respond and to understand that the holiness of God has to be appeased. But when, when the price is paid, which we know was through Jesus, that actually God's mercy, God's grace, God's love, all are available to us if we will just accept them. Maybe this morning as we just bow in in prayer, maybe this morning you've got a loved one that's far away from God. Maybe there's somebody in your family and you're thinking about them right now. You're thinking it might be a child, it might be a parent, it might be somebody in the wider family. And you know that they're not, they're not in a right relationship with God. They've never maybe, some have never given God their life. Today as you pray for them, I want you to, to know Jesus is praying for them right now. That's what he does as a high priest. He is praying for us and he is praying for those that we are praying for. He prays with us. Maybe today you're struggling financially. Well, Jesus is our provider. Just bring that to God now in prayer. Just in prayer say, Lord, I recognize that you are the one who has cleansed me and forgiven me and that you want to provide for me. This morning, cast all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. He knows how to care. He knows how to provide. Maybe you're hurting this morning emotionally. Maybe they're in a relationship and there's been difficulty, there's tension, there's, there's discord, there's arguments, there's whatever misunderstanding in relationship. But I want you to know this morning, Jesus as our high priest is our comforter. He will come and comfort, he will come and help, he will come to bring reconciliation. He is the one who can make a way where there seems to be no way. Call on him this morning if you're hurting, if you're struggling physically, Jesus is your healer. Come to him this morning and say, Jesus, I ask for your healing. You are my healer. By your stripes, I am healed. By his stripes, we are saved. We are made whole by him. Maybe you're tired, you're just exhausted. Maybe you're feeling weak this morning. It might be through illness. It might be through uh, the, the pressures of work. It might be just uh, all the things that you've got to do. It may be just your energy feels dra uh, you know, gone this morning, drained this morning. I want you to know that Jesus is your strength. As your high priest, he comes and puts the cloak of strength around you to strengthen you, to support you, and to be there with you. Whatever you are, Jesus is your peace. Jesus is our, your everything. If you will come to him this morning. Maybe this morning you need Jesus as your savior. Maybe you're here in the room and you know you, know you need Jesus as your savior. You need to acknowledge him as the high priest that he paid the price for you. Maybe you're online. Maybe you're listening to this later on in the day. But you know you need Jesus. And only as you accept Jesus, when you confess Jesus with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And if that's you today, maybe you want to just pray. and Just pray. You can pray it in your heart. You can stand and pray. You can whatever just to acknowledge Jesus as Lord and Savior. But if that's you today, then I just want you to pray. I'm going to pray and you can just pray this in your, in your heart today. Heavenly Father, I ask that you would forgive all my sins. I thank you that you are my high priest 
I thank you for dying in my place so that I can live, so that I don't have to die for my sins, but that I can live. I thank you for caring. I thank you, Jesus, that as my high priest, you pray for me every moment of the day. I thank you, Lord, today for new life. Thank you today for new opportunities. I thank you today for a righteousness, for your cloak of righteousness around me. I pray today that you would fill me with your Holy Spirit so that I can live the life that you want me to live. I want to live each day following you, pleasing you, doing what's on your heart so that, Lord, that my life can truly be new, so that no longer am I sinning against you, so that no longer am I having to have Jesus um, uh, re overcome the stench of my sin. But Lord, that I live in the righteousness of Christ, that I live with a robe of righteousness around me every day. Today, Lord, I acknowledge my life is not my own. I have no right to go where I want to go or to do what I want to do. But Lord, today I give you my life in obedience. I give it all to you. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Let's celebrate the name of Jesus. Let's celebrate the high priest because he is the one who can change everything. Amen. Thank you.